Welcome to WG Hub Live. This week is our charity special. Um, unfortunately, it has to replace our Dorset Charities Conference, the annual event that uh, everyone of any kind of interest in the, who has any kind of interest in the sector loves to attend. Um, so, in these tricky times when the sector's um, come under tremendous pressure, uh, we decided you still needed the opportunity to hear what's going on and uh, to find out who might be able to help you uh, and, and on what's going on at the minute in the sector. So uh, in a slight change to the weekly format, we have five speakers this week. Uh, they're going to be quick fire succession, so you're going to have to concentrate. But uh, they're all sort of five, five minutes, five, six minutes, and that'll make up the first half of today's session. Um, it'll then be followed by our usual <laughs> Q&A session. Um, please use the Q&A function um, on, on, on the Zoom. Um, and um, if you can just perhaps put down the name of the speaker, you'd quite like to answer the question to start with. But obviously, we've got a great panel on this morning. All the speakers uh, this morning will be acting as the panel. Um, so Q&A uh, at the end of the session, please. But keep the questions coming throughout each of these speakers. And then we can see what's coming up, and uh, hopefully you can give the guys a bit of bit of prep time for those uh, those questions. But um, I, I'm looking looking forward to today. It's uh, it's not quite the same as having our charities conference. You know, by this time today, um, in a usual year, we'd be up to our neck in uh, in preparation, getting ready for all the people to come. But you're all there. Um, I've seen so many names on the on the list. So many people. Uh, a viewing this morning who would normally come to the conference. So I hope you enjoy this. Um, if, if obviously, if, if there's subjects that come out of today that uh, need a bit more concentration, then we'll put on some more sessions uh, for the sector uh, in the following weeks. Anyway, uh, without further ado, um, I'd just like to introduce you to our, um, our speakers here this morning. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Grant Robson, Foundation Director at Dorset Community Foundation. Morning. Good morning. Great to have you with us, Grant. Um, we also have, for those who come to the Charities Conference, you'll know that we usually have a, a little technical panel session. And in this sort of format, it's, it's, it's relatively straightforward to do. Isn't it, Jeff? <laughs> I just said it could be the charity slides or it might be my holiday slides that come up. I hope I get the right ones. Either way, we'll be really happy, I'm sure. Um, so we've got uh, great Jeff, Jeff Trowbridge, a uh, charities conference uh, stalwart. Can I call him you that? Call you that yeah. uh, from Lester Aldridge, uh, obviously um, speaking on, on the legal side of things. We have our own Jen Richardson, head of charities. Good morning, Jen. Hey, good morning. So Jen's ready there for an accounting update. We also have Steve Place, um, senior advisor, Community Action Network. Good morning, Steve. Morning, everyone. It's great to have you on, Steve. Uh, looking forward to your uh, update. Uh, bits on governance, I believe, this morning. That's right. Absolutely. Fantastic. And then we also have Steve Bicknell. Uh, Steve is an ambassador for charities. Uh, he's with the Bournemouth Chamber of Trade. Uh, so he's an ambassador on the charity side. Um, here this morning, um, I think it's the first time at a Dorset Charities Conference, is it, Steve? It so is, yes. Yeah, thanks very much, Ian. Yeah, I'll be talking about what Bournemouth Chamber does in terms of charities and CSR but also about the charities forum which we hold regularly as well but obviously we haven't lately but uh, we'll, we will be doing it again very soon so fantastic, looking forward to that. fantastic. well we're looking, all looking forward to that so without further ado I think we're kicking off with uh, Grant so over to you Grant okay well thank you very much and good morning everyone um, I'm just uh, Right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, okay, well, for those of you that don't know, um, Dorset Community Foundation is a grant-making charity. Um, we are part of a network of 46 community foundations across the UK. Um, they vary in size, but effectively we all do the same thing, which is to target need and target the donations of our donors to where the need is most. And in Dorset, on a, a, a usual year, we um, grant around, around, around about £300,000 in grants, mainly to small charities, and our average grant is normally around about £2,500. We were established in the year 2000, and over the years we've, um, we've given out over £10 million now. 
That all changed at the end of March. So very quickly, we set up um, the Dorset Coronavirus Community Fund and uh, we started with zero pounds um, and we quickly uh, raised donations and launched our grant making a program. So in 12 weeks, we've received over a million pound in applications from Dorset charities. And in that time, we uh, have also awarded 180 grants. The average grant size has been 3,000. And as you can see, we've, we've given out over a half a million pounds. We have also raised uh, just over 700,000 pounds in that time, and we continue to make grants. Very broadly, um, this is a, a map of the distribution of the grants that we have made um, according to the geographical area. I'm very pleased to, to show you that, that the, uh, the distribution is, is relatively equal amongst the areas. Um, and as you can see, we've been giving out quite a considerable amount of money. Now we funded, um, as I say, nearly 180 projects and um, they have been a, a wide spectrum of causes. Obviously, um, a lot of the grant making that we've made has been to uh, emergency response, food deliveries and the like, but we have also given grants to mental health charities, uh, charities that are uh, where the beneficiaries are older people. Essentially, every, every charitable type of cause in Dorset has been supported. Um, we are particularly pleased that we've actually supported um, quite a few emerging groups. Um, as you can imagine, um, when the emergency started, um, lots of communities rose up with volunteers and we supported a lot of um, grassroots activities from brand new uh, organisations and groups. So here's, here's a list of the, the broad topics that we've um, been giving to, as you can see, and as I said, they, um, you know, they span the whole um, spectrum of, of charitable causes. Sorry. So that, in a nutshell, is what we've been doing over the last 12 weeks. It's been a, been a roller coaster, but I'm incredibly proud of my team. I'm incredibly proud of our trustees. Um, in many ways, um, this emergency uh, has proven that the Community Foundation um, has never really been uh, more relevant. And um, we hope to continue funding. Um, we realize that um, the emergency phase is now moving on to a recovery phase. And quite frankly, we are concerned about the voluntary sector in Dorset. Um, and we realize that many charities are um, experiencing a complete loss of income over the three, three months. So we're, we're going to be doing everything we can to bring on donors, bring on supporters to help support the, um, the voluntary sector in Dorset. So that was a, a, a quick whistle stop tour of what we've been doing. Um, and I'll hand over now to Jen Richardson from Ward Goodman. Thank you, Grant. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to do an even more of a whistle-stop tour than usual um, on the charity accounting update. Um, so I'm going to talk through a bit of strategic and operational planning, looking at your reserves and working capital, compliance and reporting notes, and then useful resources at the end. So all of the slides will be available on the War Goodman Hub with this recording. Um, so hopefully, um, if there's useful information in there, you will be able to go back and revisit it. Um, so to start with strategic and operational planning, um, just running through the fact that um, you should have set up some sort of crisis team or subcommittee of trustees um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, you should always continue to meet regularly, either virtually or via conference call. Um, trustees in the subcommittee should be reviewing and updating your risk assessment, so obviously taking into account any changes. And one of the most important things that we need to do is to be preparing cash flow forecasts. So I'm suggesting that charities are preparing these on a week by week basis for the next 12 weeks. Um, looking at uh, what your outflows are, looking at what your inflows are, communicating with your creditors, your debtors and your funders. So you need to make sure that you're managing your cash. An early conversation with either creditors or debtors or funders 
might make a big difference in terms of what you have to pay. Um, so you need to review and update your cash flow on a regular basis. You need to take account of any changes, as I say, that, that are happening, any big donations that you might happen to get in, any appeals that you're running um, and the expected cash that's coming in from that. Um, most importantly is knowing your charitable objectives and making sure that you are delivering on what your charitable objectives are and that you haven't got any scope creep um, in terms of the work that you're doing um, and that you are able to, to continue doing what you were set up to do. Um, we're suggesting that people forecast uh, where they will need to be in three months, in six months and next year. As Grant just said, um, we are um, coming to the recovery stage now of, of having a better understanding of where we might be. Um, although the next month or so, I would say, particularly for those charities that are just able to, to effectively open their doors again, that haven't been frontline services, that perhaps have been mothballed, um, now is a time of great uncertainty because we just don't know what the footfall is going to be. We don't know what the demand is going to be. Um, and we need to, to make sure that we have an awareness of what's coming in, what's going out and the actual changes in operational activity in, and whilst I hate this phrase, what the new normal is going to be. Um, suggest that everybody looks at the government rescue packages. Um, just be aware that the VAT deferral um, is has come to an end um, on the 30th of June. So those of you that have got quarter ends um, at the end of May, um, payment will be due on the 7th of July. We've got a change in the job retention scheme um, with effectively part-time furlough coming in from this week. But also just be aware that we still have the time to pay agreement in place. So you should talk. Um, to HMRC um, if you have any trouble in terms of paying over your taxation liabilities. I also wanted to just make a point about gift aid payments from trading subsidiaries. Um, the charity tax group has currently got representation with HMRC um, in order to renegotiate the nine month payment, um, but you should really be looking at whether those gift aid payments that come up from trading subsidiaries are actually going to be able to happen at the moment um, and look at all of the guidance around there um, and come and talk to us um, or your advisor um, if you have any queries on that. So just to have a quick look at compliance and accounts disclosures. So you can apply to the Charity Commission for an extension. Um, there's the email address that you need to reply to. If you're a limited company, you should follow the company's house guidance, which has now been extended as a three month extension for all um, companies' house filings and discuss going concern with your auditor or independent examiner or an accountant um, and use your cash flow forecast that I referred to on my first slide. Um, the Charity Sort Committee has issued really good guidance um, for trustees for inclusion of the COVID-19 um, situation uh, within the trustees report so it's looking at what's happened what's happening now and what might happen in the future um, so i would urge everybody to, ha to have a look at that guidance um, accountants and trustees should be considering material uncertainty and you need to look at how you're accounting for the government support packages again we can give you lots of assistance on that so so please come and talk to us um, there are updates on reporting serious incidents to the Charity Commission. So there's new guidance that was issued at the beginning of June. So this is um, where, for example, if charities had a 20% loss of income or 25% of their total income, they needed to report this as a serious incident to the Charity Commission. They've issued guidance to say that if those losses are due to the pandemic, you don't need to make that report to the Charity Commission. However, trustees need to consider the significance of those losses. Um, and for example, if they've had to close premises um, in accordance with government guidelines, that doesn't need to be reported as a serious incident. Um, looking at reserves, um, you need to have a look and see what you've got as your general designated, restricted or permanently endowed reserves. Um, what you need in terms of reserves to deliver your core objectives. Again, look at scope creep due to COVID-19 activities, whether you're asset rich but cash poor and whether you can repurpose any funds with the agreement of donors. So that goes back to my earlier point where you need to be talking to your funders. You need to be talking to the people that are giving you money and making sure that you have the cash so you can deliver those frontline services or those key services that you want to do moving forward. 
So my last slide is just an additional resources. Um, I just want to draw attention to the Dorset Community Action um, who carried out a state of the sector survey. They surveyed 200, I think 201 charities replied. Um, there's lots of interesting information in there and certainly for small charities, don't feel like you're alone. If you have a look at that survey, you will realise that a lot of people are in the same position as you. Um, I've also included some national resources on there. Um, those of you that are our clients will know that I keep saying sign up to NCVO, sign up to Small Charities Coalition, have a look at the Charity Tax Group, Chairs of Trustees, have a look at the Association of Chairs. There's lots of really useful information there. Um, and the mailers that we're sending out to our client list have got sort of the key points that are on there. So hopefully that's useful. Sorry it's so quick, but any questions, obviously put in the Q&A or, or drop us an email. So I will hand over to Jeff. Thanks very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to look at two specific issues that have affected some charities um, during the current crisis. Um, and then just to show that life does go on as normal, um, the results of a charity commission inquiry um, and a recent case. Now, a key issue for um, some charities has been the cost of their leases, or um, if they're in the fortunate position of having investment properties, the impact upon their income of um, a tenant's inability to pay the rent. Now the key points in looking at this is that there is no general right to withhold rent just because times have become tough. Um, it's very unlikely that the lease has frustrated um, and it just continues despite the fact that the premises may be unusable because of the um, COVID-19 crisis. So many tenants have approached landlords um, to request uh, some help um, with the rent under the leases. And there are a number of things that have got to be considered in addition to the straightforward question of can the rent be reduced? Firstly, is it a reduction or a suspension? If the rent is suspended, when is it going to be payable again in full? What will trigger the reinstatement of the rent? And there's a, you really do need to look at all the lease terms. If the rent is suspended for interest, for in, instance, and is then paid later, is interest payable on that rent? There may well be a, a almost certainly be a clause in the uh, lease that says that interest will be payable on rent that is payable late. Um, alternatives for rent suspension might be to ask the landlord to dip into any rent deposit that he might hold, or there might be scope for a reduction in service charges. Um, if the rent deposit monies are used, will that deposit have to be topped up at a later date? So there are quite a lot of things to consider in addition to simply should the rent be reduced. And the important thing is whatever is agreed, do document it because um, the scope for misunderstandings um, come the next rent quarter day uh, would be quite substantial without a, a formal document. So what is the position for charity trustees um, faced with a, a request from a tenant that the rent should be reduced? Well, the code of practice for the commercial property sector says that landlords should provide support to a tenant where reasonably possible, but they must have regard to their fiduciary duties. And of course, charity trustees have to act in the best interests of the charity. So if there is a request for a rent reduction from the tenant of a charity, the trustees need to investigate it. What is the tenant's financial position? They've got to consider the risk of a void um, if the tenant becomes insolvent, but they can perhaps also in some circumstances take account of a reputational risk. If for instance, a charity is granted a lease to um, say another charity. And then they must consider all the options I set out on that first slide. There are restrictions on landlords. All possession proceedings current on the 27th of March were suspended until the 23rd of August. And in practice, no real steps can be taken to forfeit a lease um, before the 30th of September. Now, if trustees are faced with the worst and there is a real risk that the charity may be insolvent, they really have to stop and take stock at an early stage. With unincorporated charities, there is of course the 
risk of personal liability for debts if they can't be paid out of the assets of the charity. With charitable companies and charitable incorporated organisations, the trustees have to bear in mind the test of insolvency. Is the organisation unable to pay its debts as and when they fall due? And do the debts exceed the assets? And once a charity gets into that sort of position, the duty to creditors and to minimise the risk to creditors overrides the duties to beneficiaries. Now, you may have seen some things in the press about suspension of the wrongful trading rules. Wrongful trading is where trustees or directors continue to operate even when they know or ought to have known that there's no realistic prospect of recovery. What the 2020 Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act does is to say that there's in effect a moratorium between 1st of March and 30th of September and any actions of the trustees in that period will be discounted in looking to see whether the trustees have behaved properly whilst trying to carry on the business. So they're not responsible for any worsening of the position during that period. But despite that moratorium, trustees should also be wary of any breach of their duties as trustees. For instance, um, a, company, a charity may not be insolvent because it has sufficient restricted funds to meet its debts, but those funds shouldn't be used uh, because of the restrictions attached. So trustees have to be aware of that um, almost exception to the moratorium. So meanwhile, what else has been going on? Well, the Charity Commission has issued a very long and frankly rather scathing report on the RNIB. The nub of the problem was, was failures in governance, um, which led to uh, a residential um, home and school having serious failings. It's a long, lengthy report, but it just emphasises the need for adequate and effective governance. And then finally, um, a decision reported about 10 days ago concerning um, a dispute amongst the congregation of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewakido Church. It centred around whether members, as opposed to trustees, have a duty to act in the best interests of the charity. It was held that they do, but that duty is to act in what the individual member subjectively thinks is in the best interest of the charity. I rather think that case and everything that comes from it is going to run and run because I can't see how that could ever be um, properly resolved. And with that, and with the comments about governance, I'll hand over to Steve Pless from CAN. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Okay, so um, I'm Steve Place from Community Action Network. Uh, CAN, if people don't know what that is, that is the name now for the merged Bournemouth CVS with Pool CVS. Um, and we provide advice, support, advocacy, and representation for community and voluntary groups across Bournemouth, Christchurch, and Pool. Uh, and we're also the volunteer centre uh, for that area as well. Uh, and if you're in across the border in Dorset, then those roles are carried out by Dorset Community Action and Volunteer Centre Dorset. Uh, I do most of the one-to-one -one advice and support to organisations and groups. When I was asked uh, about doing something for this session this morning, I thought what I might do something uh, around the relationship between members and the committee because I keep on coming up with um, groups that don't quite understand the relationship, the legal relationship between the two, uh, and quite often can get it wrong. And it could have some consequences in the future. So sorry if I'm going to teach you how to suck eggs, but I'm just going to go briefly around that relationship uh, and then talk about uh, really what the COVID-19 has had in terms of uh, meetings. Um, Okay, so your organisational structure. So really what we're talking about is that when a group gets set up and individuals come together to agree to work for a common goal. Uh, and sometimes those members, depending on your legal structure, might be called shareholders, they might be called guarantors, or they might have some other arcane name. Uh, they agree to work together uh, through some sort of rules, which we generally call a governing document. Now, those rules actually might just be verbal. 
uh, but actually it's a collective agreement uh, and actually a bit of like a contract and in fact those members could go to court to take the organization to task because it hasn't followed those rules so that's why it's generally agreed that those uh, those rules should be written down and again depending on your go at your, your your legal structure that governing document might be called articles of association they might be called a constitution uh, and it might be called rules or some other again some other name now obviously if it's a large group of people they can't effectively make decisions to run the organization so those members then delegate it to some form of committee a smaller group of people now again depending on your legal structure that might be called something like uh, uh, a board or uh, uh, a governing body uh, a council uh, and the members of that committee might be called things like directors trustees governors and so on However, it usually remains that some fundamental decisions about the organization must be made by the members. And quite often those are the changes to the governing document, the rules that uh, dictate how the organization is run and probably around closing. But actually the governing document might set out other things that the members must actually make decisions on rather than the committee itself. Uh, often, for instance, uh, for a lot of charities, uh, it might be about actually electing the trustees onto the board. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is, is that both groups can be the same people. Uh, and when you look at some sort of template governing documents, they have that sort of uh, name. So, for instance, if you are a community interest company, uh, the CIC regulator calls that a small membership. If you're a CIO, it's called a foundation CIO. Uh, whereas if you have more members than committee, again, CICs call that a uh, large membership and uh, CIOs, they're called uh, association models. Now, if you look at a, a company limited by guarantee model, they don't generally have that. If you, if you read it, it tends to assume that actually you have a larger group of members uh, than directors, guarantors, but actually there's nothing to say that has to be that. So you could have uh, what's called an oligarchy model where actually the directors and the guarantors are exactly the same people. Um, okay. So what type are you? Do you have to have member meetings? Um, so for instance, uh, very often it, there is the need to have an annual general meeting of your members but you need to check your governing documents to see actually what sort of members you have to have for instance i've seen some constitutions where you you have to have at least two member meetings a year an agm and another meeting once a year but it will be in your governing document you know, understand when you need a member decision and again, that will probably be very clearly spelled out in your governing document. And then how do you get a member decision? Again, your governing document will probably have sections about uh, notice, quorum, uh, and how decisions are made, whether there's a majority um, or whether it has to be unanimous. And then you have to record and file it if necessary. Now, what I've come across sometimes is even when, for instance, trustees and their guarantors or their members are exactly the same people, they've changed the constitution of the organization at a trustee meeting rather than at a meeting and a minute in a trustee meeting. If that needs to be minuted set as a separate, totally separate meeting. And then it might be needed to be filed. For instance, uh, if you're a, a charitable company, then some of the changes might need to be filed with Companies House. If you're changing your constitution, then you should file it also with the, the Charity Commission. Um, the reason why I've done, said, said all this is that uh, a lot of the times people are not following their governing document. Over the years, for instance, practices and ways of doing have crept in uh, and people have uh, taken decisions of organized meetings in a particular way, which are actually contrary to their governing document. And the trouble is, if they do that, then it could be challengeable and those decisions could be null and void and they could have some consequences. 
and quite often it's going to be when somebody wants to make some trouble uh, that actually they will point out that a decision actually that was made at this meeting wasn't effective because it wasn't taken in the correct way and that's going to take up a lot of time and energy for any organization to, to deal with so um, if it's not working for you in your governing document, then change it. Don't just work in a different way. Actually go through the process of, of changing your governing document so that actually becomes fit for purpose. And I'm sure people like Jeff and me have seen some constitutions, governing documents, that for instance, of a date from the ARC, I think the worst one I've ever had a couple of years ago was one that was set up in 1955 and had never had any changes. Uh, and the organisation over the years have been doing different things than were actually in its governing document. Okay, but of course the whole issue of meetings has become a bit more problematic because of COVID-19 and the legal and the guidance about people meeting together. Now, um, it's established in law that actually present, what that means, present, is that as long as everyone can hear and see each other, that means they are together. So you can use virtual meetings as long as everyone can hear and see each other. Now, that's going to be dependent on how many uh, people you've got involved at any one time and dependent on the platform you've got. So, for instance, if you're using Teams, Teams won't show everyone uh, above a certain number. Is it nine? Something like that. Uh, and, of course, uh, people have actually got to have their video on. They can't sort of like blank themselves out because uh, either they haven't uh, they haven't had done their hair that 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 day or they're still in their pajamas and therefore turn their video camera off because then that will make that null and void. So actually, even if your governing document doesn't say anything at all about virtual meetings, as long as everyone can hear and see each other, then then the, the meeting can go ahead. But then your governing document can uh, pro probably extend that by actually only allowing hearing so that you can use, for instance, conference calls. But it actually has to be, has to be specific in your, in your uh, governing document. And, and also there is this thing about, uh, for instance, a committee board has this thing of uh, unanimous decisions. So that actually as long as a, a group of people all agree then that can stand as a decision even though they weren't all in the room at one time uh, so for instance that's how you can use written resolutions again regardless of whether it's in your governing document or not but again it's a good idea to have that in your documents because it might specify things uh, a bit, bit more flexibilities and the same is true about member meetings and, and of course if you've got a large membership the whole thing about virtual use of virtuals it becomes perhaps even more problematic because you can't, you won't, might not be able to get everybody on your screen to see them. Um, and again, written resolutions can be used by incorporated bodies, but they can't by unincorporated unless it's actually specific in their, in their governing document. Um, now, some has already made reference to the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, which became law last Friday after actually having waited months for it since the government announced it. Uh, but basically, it's only available to incorporated organisations, so to companies, CIOs and a range of mutuals uh, like community benefit societies and so on. But it's not available to um, any organisation so by, by, by Parliament or Royal Charter and particularly to unincorporated bodies. Now, still quite a lot of charities uh, are actual charitable trusts or they're unincorporated associations. So in fact, this flexibility isn't going to be allowed, they can't use this. So the first important one is about AGMs. And I've had a couple of organizations that already are saying to me during the COVID-19 crisis, what, we've got an AGM coming up, what can, what, what can we do about it? Well, basically, if your AGM was due to happen between the 26th of March and the 30th of September, then actually you can extend the period that you've got to have it uh, at any time in that period. Uh, most templates for charities talk about that the AGM has to be held within 15 months of the previous one. So you might find actually that, you know, although you might have had your AGM a year ago, the fact that your, your, your governing document allows you to hold it for another three months. But actually, if, if the 15 months deadline or whatever fits within that period, then you can extend it. 
And the government's already said that actually it might use secondary legislation to extend this period, in fact, up to the, up to the, uh, the end of the financial year, up to the 31st of March. So probably the, this period will be extended anyway. Um, and um, once that happens, um, people like us, DCA, uh, all, all the other umbrella bodies will probably tell you that uh, this period has been extended. The other thing is about actually making use of virtual meetings. So regardless of the current law or what's in your governing document, it will allow you to use virtual meetings uh, and that probably you don't have to have to have be seen. You don't even have to talk so that you could actually just use, you know, tally voting, for instance, rather than people raising a hand or, or, or whatever. So I've got those here and as just as the, these slides are going to be available um, on the website anyway. So I won't run through those so that we can move on. Uh, and of course, the Charity Commission has uh, already updated its COVID-19 guidance. Uh, if you, don't, you haven't seen this at all, you should have a look at it because it covers other things that the Charity Commission are advising charities about. But this is the section around uh, its meetings. Uh, as it says, uh, this, is, this is the quote. Uh, first one I think is a catch-22 and I'd be interested to know what Jeff's view on this is because it says that you know an alternative for charity is for them to change the requirements in their governing document about their timing uh, yeah. well don't you usually need a members meeting to organize to change the governing document so that's a catch-22 for me so unless he knows some ar other ar ar arcane way that trustees can change the timing of their meetings without a members meeting I'd be interested to know um, but actually if you can't use the flexibilities then the trustees need to have a meeting and basically minute why they can't hold the meeting uh, so to demonstrate good governance of your charity of course, I think this still might mean that your any decisions that are made by, for instance, uh, a board of trustees that is not properly uh, properly appointed might still be challengeable. I guess I'm sure people would generally understand it. OK, that was a quick chunter through some of the stuff. And now I'll hold a hand over to uh, Steve Bicknell from Bournemouth Chamber. Thanks very much, Steve. Let me just... Uh... Share my screen. Okay, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, what Bournemouth Chamber have been doing on corporate social responsibility. As many of you might know, I was the vice president for quite a number of years, and now I'm an ambassador leading the um, work that the chamber does on uh, we work with charities and work with businesses to make them more corporately social, socially responsible. And for us, that really comes in several categories. So um, we um, focus particularly on how to support charities. Uh, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, also about supporting employees, which includes their mental health in the workplace, as well as flexible working, other kinds of things around that area. Also supporting local businesses and trying to buy nationally if, if you can't buy locally, because obviously that helps um, from, from a, a sustainability perspective and also being sustainably in, sustainability in general. So we're looking at, uh, at ways that businesses can um, reduce their waste, be green in the way that they do things and so on. And we've got a, a special website called CSR Online which um, it has a scheme that businesses can join and, and take part in a questionnaire. This was developed with CAN and also developed with BCP Council um, as, a, as a way of um, making sure that businesses do try and comply and try and, try and, try and be more corporate, corporately socially responsible. So the kind of questions that we ask businesses about charities is how many days per year do they and their staff volunteer? Um, they have to actually enter a specific number, so we're asking very specific questions, not just vague comments. Um, how much and your, have, have you and your business donated to charities and social enterprises in the last 12 months? How, how much have your staff donated through payroll giving? Which charities do, does your business support? And what skills and services do you offer to businesses? So. We tried to be specific because in the past we felt that many businesses have just given lip service to helping charities and not actually done very much to really support them. 
So we've tried to be more specific in the way that we've guided businesses and also to be able to measure the, the results of that to make sure that uh, businesses do uh, um, grow year on year in the way that they support charities. We also hold a charities forum. Um, this is a, uh, th that link is actually an old one because we, we, we're planning the next one, which will be in September at the moment. Um, and that will be one that will be run jointly with uh, CAN and also with BCP Council. And we're talking about how uh, charities can access local lottery funding. Um, if you look at the events that we've held on Charities Forum, they uh, are very popular. We do hold one each year where we have businesses and charities there. And the idea there is that businesses will come and try and find charities that they can work with. So they'll look at how they can donate their skills, how they can donate their resources, their money, uh, their services, whatever they can do to help charities. And we, we, we have over 100 uh, attendees at those events. And uh, at the last one when we did it, where we were split between businesses and charities, it's about 40% uh, businesses and 60% charities. But each year we work on improving that and that has grown rapidly over the years. So, uh, so we are trying to build on that. We do get some big businesses attend, obviously uh, JP Morgan attend, who is Bournemouth's largest employer. Uh, also the also uh, Bournemouth and Paul College. We get all sorts of people there who can help charities. And it's a good opportunity for charities to make contacts with businesses that can uh, help them and vice versa. And also can have been very helpful in helping us to follow up on those to make sure that where people have made promises to help charities that they've delivered on them afterwards, how successful that, that has been and how it can be improved. So this is typically what it looks like at our charities forum. Uh, lots of mix of charities and businesses. These are free events. Um, they are held at a church, which is St. Francis. Um, and the reason for that is that we want this event to be free um, and as all inclusive as possible. You don't, you don't have to be a member of Bournemouth Chamber. You don't even have to be based in Bournemouth. Any charity would be very welcome to come and any business uh, would be welcome to attend as well to see how they can help charities. Uh, and it's a very informal thing, but also it's used as an educational opportunity. So we will have speakers there who will try to uh, educate charities on how they can improve themselves. Uh, also, it's an opportunity for charities to network with each other, learn from each other on things that work and things that don't work and share ideas. And typically after this event, the charities forum, uh, Cam will share ideas between different charities that have been attending on how they can pick up on things that, that would help their charities to be more successful. We also have a blog at Bournemouth Chamber um, and uh, it's specifically dedicated to helping charities and we've been successful in helping charities in a number of ways. So typically charities will need um, trustees at different times and trustees can sometimes be quite hard to come by. Um, businesses are a good source of trustees so we've, uh, we've helped a number of charities by promoting their, you know, they send us in blogs that they'd like to post. It's also advocacy sent us once and they were looking for a couple of people with professional skills to join their board of trustees. And we were able to advertise that, help them to find some people. And I know that they were successful in finding people to join their trustee board as a result of putting out this kind of post that you can see there. Um, so we will share that with our business community to try and find people who can positively make a difference to charities either as a trustee or with their skills or, or some other way so anything that's news for charities please send it in to us and we can try and promote that for them also the chamber does have a number of events throughout the year and at those events you'll see at the bottom of that uh, particular poster from a previous christmas event that we were supporting bournemouth hospital dorset children's foundation um, so, so we do raise money for directly, for directly for charities as well at the events that we organise. And I think pretty much every event that Bournemouth Chamber has, there is an opportunity for charities to, to gain money through raffles and things, and things like that that we will hold at the, at the event. So we are very much charity orientated. Another thing that a lot of people don't necessarily realise is that uh, back in 2012, there was a Social Value Act that was passed. It is law and it does require councils and other public sector bodies to consider 
um, the social impact of their decisions. And that can actually ripple quite a long way down the supply chain. So um, when the council place a large order with somebody, they can look at the effect on local jobs, but they can also look at how those uh, businesses are being socially responsible, how they are working with local charities. And I think that businesses need to play a more active role in working with local charities going forward, because many charities, as we know, have suffered over the last few months, just like businesses have in terms of loss of income and that kind of thing. So we will need to increase corporate social responsibility as much as possible and get businesses to help charities wherever they can. And uh, this is quite a useful bit of legislation. It hasn't really been used massively. Uh, and, we, and the Chamber continues to work with Bournemouth Council to try to get them to implement more of this kind of stuff in their decision-making processes. Um, rather than simply focusing on lowest price, they need to focus on the social value that's been added by placing those contracts. It's also important to remember that for businesses, uh, corporates being uh, corporately socially responsible is not necessarily a cost. Most businesses seem to think it's some kind of an additional cost that they're going to incur. But in, a, in actual fact, it can increase the customer and brand loyalty improve productivity by having a happy, happier workforce and uh, be better for the planet if they become more sustainable. So there are a lot of positives associated with CSR and businesses need to take that on board and realise that actually it could make them more profitable if they adopted CSR policies. Many of them don't have those in place at the moment. Bournemouth Chamber of Commerce is made up of volunteers. It's a not-for-profit organisation. Um, no directors or uh, no, no directors of the chamber or anybody in any senior roles are paid any money for their, their work for the chamber. It's all done on a voluntary basis. And the cost for charities to join should they wish to is only £37.50 per year. So it's a very cheap price. Uh, as I say, you don't need to be a member to come to the charities forum. But being a member will allow you to promote your uh, charitable activities through all of the Chamber's resources, their website, their social media and so on. We can do press releases and all that kind of stuff. So we can do more things for you if you are a member. But even if you're not a member, we will still do whatever we can to support charities, particularly local charities. So if there's anything that uh, is in there of interest to any charities listening in or, or anybody who wants to talk to us about any of those features, then please do get in touch and they can contact me or they can contact the chamber directly. My contact details are there. Uh, and I'd be happy to try and find ways to, to help charities and help businesses to help charities too. So uh, thanks very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay, thanks. well, thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you to, to the, uh, all the speakers this morning. Uh, fantastic diversity there. Um, again, a mini conference, a mini conference. Yeah, I think you've done an amazing job in three quarters of an hour, to be honest, 50 minutes. We usually have a conference in a, you know, six hours. So well done for putting that together. <laughs> um, and I, and I, obviously we have to realize that, you know, you also you know, made a good job of uh, compacting uh, the information you were trying to put across. So um, thanks very much. And we hope to get um, um, some questions coming through. We have got some questions already. And I think I might just, uh, as you've just finished, Steve, um, there's a question uh, from Cathy. Um, have you yeah. got the results of your CSR survey? Yes, we have. We collect the results onto a smart sheet. So when people answer the questions, we can compare them and we do compare them year by year. And we give um, awards to, or certificates, not as much of an award, but it's a certificate to businesses that participate and show that they have been corporately socially responsible. So, for example, um, two of the large organisations that won our gold award were Castle Point and also uh, Bournemouth and Paul College. Um, Bournemouth and Paul College, uh, in particular, do a huge amount of volunteering through their students. Um, and... Um, Castle Point have done a, a huge amount of work, um, a little bit with charities, but also a lot of work around sustainability. So yes, we do collect the results, and it was an, actually a requirement of, Bourne, of BCP Council that we would be able to share the results with them so that they could show that their support for our project was justifiable. 
um, there's nothing like some results to be able to justify the, the, uh, the, the, the work that's being done. So yes, we do collect results and we do share those results. They are shared on a confidential basis with Bournemouth Council, BCP. So that, that's not sort of open information as such? It's not, yeah. although you can tell the people that do the most, if they get, in a, if they get a gold award, then, then they've, they've done quite a lot. <laughs> we have bronze, yeah. silver in and gold. General, does it, would it, would there, is there a general picture, if you like, of sort of how many organisations, you know, I mean, I know roughly, for yeah. instance, there's about 9,000 companies, I think, in Dorset. Yeah, yeah um, there are, yeah. You know, so, so how many you know, actually are doing some kind of sort of charitable work or? In terms of those participating in our scheme, it's a very small number at the moment. Uh, we want to grow that as much as possible. We've been working with the membership of uh, Bournemouth and uh, Bournemouth Chamber of Commerce to try to do that. And one of the reasons I've become an ambassador rather than being vice president is to enable me to work with a wider range of organisations it was felt perhaps that there could be a conflict if I went, if I was a director of the chamber and also talking to Dorset Chamber, FSB, Institute of Directors and other organisations about how they can work with uh, charities. So it was felt that if I was an ambassador, I could have a wider range of freedom to go and work with those organisations as well. And that's yeah. what we plan to do. Uh, so we do, we, 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 We've been going for a while, but we do need to widen the scope and, and bring in more organisations and get a wider acceptance for it. And CAN and BCT and BCP Council have been key to that, and we hope to widen that. Um, but currently, there are only a very small proportion mm. of, the, of the businesses in Dorset participating, but we hope to grow that number. Grant, how, how do you think we can do that? Um, you, you know, you talk about you're, you're trying to increase the amount of... Uh, you know, income into the pot that you can then redistribute. Uh, what do you think is the most effective uh, way of doing that, do you think? There's a number of ways that, um, that I think um, can be, can be utilised. I mean, it's all about um, showing the impact of organisations' work and then demonstrating that to potential donors. Um, we're particularly keen on those grassroots smaller charities, and I think there's there's a lot to be done about showing the worth of those organisations to companies, to donors, both um, lo local, i.e. on the same street, regionally and e even nationally. Um, so it's all about telling stories and, and those stories being appropriate um, and um, understood by businesses um, so they, they can make the most difference, really. And are you, are you, have you got sort of some practical help there for, for organisations? in the sector to to do that well our, our role in uh, as far as businesses are concerned is that we can help businesses target their their um their donations their support to where the need is most so with our, our vast network of uh, groups that we funded we we are confident that um, if a, a company or an individual whoever it might be wants to do something um with, with their, their capacity to give we can direct that to um, where where it's going to have most impact and where the need is most and and steve on the volunteering side then um is there anything that we can we can do to to encourage i guess you mean me steve yes yeah, sorry steve place <laughs> i'm so sorry yeah. <laughs> yeah no i said to you yesterday i said you know when we were planning this i'm going to struggle here <laughs> so sorry steve place what, what uh, yeah, yeah, I, th I think I think um, it, what's really interesting about the COVID nineteen experience is there's been this burst of people that have come forward to try and volunteer, and sometimes I have to say the state hasn't been very good at managing them, and therefore some have probably had their expectations you know burst because they haven't been called upon. But certainly in uh, the BCP area, um, and I think something's very similar is happening in Dorset as well. Is that um, we and Volunteer Centre Dorset, you know, w did have uh, a list of people who were coming forward to help locally. And some of those were allocated to volunteer with the, the local authority and with the uh, and with local health. But we want to pick up on those and, and help and encourage and finding them volunteering opportunities going forward. But I think for the sector, it's more about again having to rethink about the opportunities that they're providing because it's interesting certainly in, in Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul the people coming forward with those probably of working age who currently have time on their hands and wanted to do stuff now as things start to go back to work 
they obviously won't have as much time and therefore we want to encourage volunteering opportunities that maybe they can do around their work and family life you know so it might be stuff that's online or it might be at other times than you know nine to five monday to friday this is quite interesting. last week it's, it's very interesting because last week we, we were talking about uh, culture change out of covid and the way people were beh behavioral change um, if anybody wants to look back at last week the video is uh, is on the, on wg hub um but uh you know what i think what you're saying here is we have got a change in behavior um in some in some people because they've had some time available and can we maintain that change in behavior also develop that in, into a, a general change yeah and, and and the culture change has got to change within the, the charity sector particularly around volunteering and i think you know local community action uh, that actually we can't carry on in the same old way you know for instance advertising for volunteers and expecting them to you know give at least three days a week for instance you know mondays to fridays to do stuff it's about restructuring the sort of roles and activities that they can be involved in so as so they can fit it around their their their, their family and their work life no very good so we've got a um we've got a few questions coming in um talking about um there's a question here um about about sort of shrinkage if you like shrinking of the charity sector in the short term so lisa's uh does it mean that like-minded organizations joining together you know may create a beneficial change out of the pandemic um are you seeing that jeff are you seeing any more sort of you know contraction and sort of more merge <laughs> At the moment, I'm not seeing um, charities actively pursuing a merger with others um, because of some sort of consolidation in the sector. I think it's probably too early for that. The crisis came on everybody very quickly, and it's just been a question of how do we survive the next few months? I think perhaps in the coming months, as people start to look more, uh, more strategically and also have a better picture of the longer term effects of the crisis on their funding and also on the work that they're going to have to try and do, we might start to see that. Um, from my perspective, I think the two main things that people have got to think about, if you are contemplating a merger, do look at it early. There's no point in putting together two charities, each of which are in financial difficulties and expecting to get a nice brand new one that won't have financial difficulties. So don't wait until the financial difficulties are forcing you to think about it because it's probably too late then. And secondly, I often find that there's an awful lot of um, emotion connected with a charity merger. With a commercial merger, eventually, to put it bluntly, the money talks. Somebody is going to make a profit from it. But with a charity merger, someone spent a lot of time, they've committed a lot of themselves into building up the charity, and they become very emotionally attached, which makes it very difficult to take a, dis uh, a dispassionate view and a really clear strategic view. And I think that's something that people have got to think about and um, try to put to one side um, the emotional attachment to the, the charity they've worked for. Okay. So, I, I echo Jeff's. Yeah, I was going to say, Jen, you, you're a great proponent of, uh, of, of this, not, not shrinkage of the sector. No, no, no. But charities working together, the collaborative element, the, the, the bringing together of similar you know, like-minded people. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the theme of our Dorset Charities Conference has always been communicate, educate, collaborate. Um, and it is very much about taking this as an opportunity to, to work with another organisation. Can you be more effective if you pull your resources? Some charities have um, financial constraints on them. Some charities have volunteer constraints. And if charities are talking together, and, and this is, as I say, always what we try and get people to do at, at the Charities Conference and, and hopefully now, you know, in, in more virtual situations, is, is work with each other the strengths in one charity can complement the weaknesses in another. And it might not be a full on merger at this point in time, but it's very much a looking at how you can work together in order to deliver to beneficiaries. Echo what Jeff said in terms of that emotional involvement. It is very hard. 
but if everybody is focused on achieving the charitable objectives that's actually the key what difference are we trying to make to beneficiaries and anecdotally talking to, to lots of our clients as I've done over the past three months particularly um, there are charities that are welcoming with open arms smaller charities smaller community groups that fit within their objectives that will enable the longevity of the delivery of services perhaps in a very very specific area geographically or in a very specific part of of uh, charitable requirements for beneficiaries um, and and they are happy and they are open to working with with other charities because the the point is we want to be able to deliver in the best possible way to the beneficiaries in Dorset that need our help. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, no, I, t I totally agree. I mean, let's just hope that uh, yeah, there isn't an overall shrinkage in the long term. No, I, yeah, yeah. I think I think I think this this shrinkage thing is a, is is a bit of a sort of miasma, really, because actually, so when you look at the public image of charities then most people think of the big nationals and they're the ones that hit the press so you hear see you see the big redundancies that are happening in some of the big nationals uh, and therefore uh, uh, and some may be even talking talking about closing now they're, they're the ones that probably have been hit because they rely an awful lot on large participation fundraising events which obviously haven't been able to take place um, uh, during the crisis but if you look at the bottom end of the scale, there is an awful lot of little small groups that have been set up to cope with COVID-19. Uh, and certainly us and BCP Council are looking, in, looking in, the, in the Bournemouth Christchurch and Poole area, talking to those groups saying, well, actually, once we get out of this, you know, do you want to carry on uh, providing help and assistance to local people in need? Now, some will probably say, no, we were just set up for COVID-19. It's over and done with. That's all that's all I've done and dusted. Thanks very much. Some might actually want to continue. And I think we have to remember that even the big national names all started off from one or two people who had a passion to fill a need. And they've all grown from that. And that will continue to happen in the sector. So we might see some big and medium scale charities disappearing, but I'm sure we will still see lots and lots of grassroots, grassroots groups coming in at the bottom and there'll be that continuous churn. It might just be a bit of a hiccup. We might see more uh, churn because of COVID-19, but actually the sector itself will still continue to grow, I think. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm just going to take I just a add something, Ian. Sorry, could I oh, just? Yeah, add... I was just going to bring you in. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think there's. I think Steve's absolutely right. Um, uh, and 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 it's it's worth bearing in mind that it, quite frankly, hardship in its many uh, forms is only going to increase in the short term. And as the statutory sector retreats, uh, rightly or wrongly, in that gap will be, um, you know, charities groups coming together to address that need. Um, so yeah, rather than a shrinkage, I think it's going to be people um, adapting to a increased level of, of disadvantage in Dorset, because it frankly is going to increase. Um, and then just quickly on the point of collaboration, I think um, like any organization in a pressurized situation finds things about themselves, they find they find out how to be more efficient. And certainly what we've seen in our, in our funding is that the groups are collaborating together. They're, they're becoming aware of the services that other groups um, literally next door to them are doing that they've never done before. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 certainly that there's a lot of potential for collaboration going forward, but like I say, I, I don't, we don't think um, there's going to be uh, shrinkage in, in that sense. It's, it's just going to be um, uh, charities adapting to the, the changing environment. Okay. No, oh, thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to take a sort of slight change to direction with the questions. We've got um, a question. I'm going to open up with you, Jen, first uh, from Judy. Who would we approach to help us with changing to a CIO? So these are structural changes here. Um, well, it, it, it really depends what you are at the moment. Um, and um, obviously the charities team at War Goodman can assist and this is something that can offer as a service and, and Jeff as well. So um, there are lots of 
organisations out there that, that can support you. I think the most important thing is that the trustees or existing trustees, if, if you are an unincorporated charity, for example, um, are understanding, you know, the importance of, of changing to an incorporated entity. Um, Steve referred earlier to, you know, some sometimes difficulties with, within unincorporated charities in, in terms of holding the meetings and the um, archaic on some occasions constitutions that are in place in, in charities that have been running for a long time. So it's uh, understanding where you are at the moment and understanding where you want to get to and then ensuring that you are in the right vehicle legal entity in, in order to make sure that you can get there. Yeah. And as you know, Jen, you work very closely with Jeff on these things as well. Jeff, um, in terms of a CIO, is there anything you, you know you just want to sort of pinpoint there or is the importance of, of, a, of a change into a CIO? I think it should be taken as an opportunity to review the governing document and bring things up to date because the CIO constitution is now a fairly well trodden path um, and it may well help to streamline the governance depending upon how the charity is set up at the moment. Um, and I mean, just to add to what Jenna said, I know that, um, for instance, um, Steve at CAN has ad advised on the constitutional side of CIOs and the registration of the charity commission. Um, I've worked with Steve when perhaps there's been a complication over permanent endowment or some land or um, property within the, the charity. So there are a number of um, organisations that can that can help on this. Okay, Steve, um, Steve Place. So can what can can what can can do? Uh, yeah, well, I suppose this is where I we get a bit sort of into things. So obviously, we can do it for free, whereas Jeff and Jeff will, <laughs> will, will charge. Um, but, you know, if it's a relatively simple charity, then actually, obviously, we can do it for free. Uh, DCA will probably offer to do that, and partly there might be a charge there, but you might need to talk to them. So if you're in BCP area, you could come and talk to us, first of all, uh, to see if it's pretty simple. But if it's got some complication, like as I said with Jeff, if it's got sort of endowments and stuff and that just complicates the whole matter, then it's better to be picked up by someone with more professional um, accounting or, 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 or legal stuff. So I, I'd pro probably, if you wanted a bit of free advice, then to begin with, to see where you go, then talk to CAN or if you're in the county, talk to DCA. I might, there might be some people here, for instance, who are outside of Dorset. Uh, you might want to talk to your local CVS to see if they provide that service as well. So if you go to the NAVCA website, you'll be able to uh, put in your postcode and find out if there is a local CVS and find out if they offer that particular service. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, we're all in this, this together, don't forget. Um, you know, we pick up on uh, organisations uh, to help them to, to sort of move forward. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, let's, let's take the advice that's available for free um, and let's all work together for the longer term. I think that's the, that's the picture here. Um, so that's, that's great stuff. So thanks very much. Um, hope that uh, resolves your issue, Judy. Um, so we've got a question here. It's about money. Um, but I, I think we might be coming to you, Grant, for, an, for, a, for a first view on this. So a question from Madeline, Virgin Money published a short report yesterday that said that although donations were up 150%, it was prioritised to NHS and food bank charities, donations up 2,000 and 3,000 percent respectively. But for the mass, vast majority of charities have seen a significant drop and on average 44% across all other charities. What does the panel think about the future direction of giving will be? So I'm going to, I'm just coming over to you, Grant, because I said I'd come to you first. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, there's a couple of couple of things to think about there. Um, the the increase in donations is obviously, um, you know, there's been a, a huge swell in goodwill uh, across the public for NHS projects, understandably. Um, and the drop in uh, donations from, from other charities is predominantly because the community fundraising that they would be doing in uh, in the last three months just simply hasn't happened. So nobody nobody has really been doing cake sales, dress down days, marathons, things like that. So that that's where that drop is is, is coming. I think where where giving is going, again, there's an opportunity. Um, I think never before has Dorset and and many other 
counties, obviously, recognise the need on their doorstep. Um, so there's there is a you know a growing sense of understanding about the needs within communities in Dorset, the local village, the local town, whatever it might be. So there is a real opportunity for charities to tap into that. Um, and also, I mean, there, uh, there has to be, I think, coming from a sort of charity fundraising background, there has to be a greater awareness of the return on, on investment when it comes to um, seeking donations. So I, I think charities need to think more carefully about um, major donor fundraising and also um, legacies because they offer the best return on, on investment and, and that's where significant donations can be found. Yeah, so so I would say an important thing that's going to have to change in the future is that businesses are going to have to step up and do more to support local charities and charities of all types because Historically, there's been a sort of a feeling that perhaps government and local authorities should be paying the bill for all these different services and things. And we know that going forward, we're going to go through a very difficult economic time with lots of redundancies, lots of um, you know, cutbacks in government spending and probably increases in taxes and stuff. So it's not going to be a good time, but businesses don't operate in isolation. They're surrounded by you know, their, their local community. And if they want their local community to be supportive of them, then I think they need to step up and show people that they are actually doing stuff to support the local community and make it stronger so that they can become stronger as a result. So I think that businesses need to do much more to step up going forward and that that will then have a knock-on effect of helping charities. That's certainly something that I would definitely be campaigning for and trying to uh, achieve in the local area so so businesses need to step up and do more to help local community and local charities yeah. steve place do you want to add anything to that i think just reflecting i think what what grant said um is that um you know you look at fun why people give money usually it's quite often a, a strong, immediate emotional response. So that's why you've seen that growth go to the NHS, even though we might actually say that a lot of people thought they were giving money to the NHS, to frontline workers, whereas in fact, it's not. It's for additional stuff. Uh, but um, that's why people were give it, give it, giving the money. Um, but it's also that uh, all the research keeps saying that uh, donors are getting more and more canny. They want to see that the money they give is uh, affecting change and that actually they might see that more locally. So I think, again, it's a bit of a culture shift for more locally based charities to start thinking about looking at developing their individual fund funder base. They haven't particularly spent an awful lot of that. But that's going to need some investment. You know, that's why the big charities raise those squillions is because they have huge fundraising teams that are doing it. And quite often in small local charities, of course, it's seen as a sort of bit of an add on for somebody's job to fit in, you know, like a 30 minutes a week if they're lucky. Whereas it needs that investment in time and energy and, and probably expertise to actually, you know, find the gold. Hmm. Yeah. So how do you feel about uh, expertise and in, the, uh, in, in the business sector, Jeff, and what we could do to help in terms of uh, knowledge and, and input? Well, that's an interesting one. I think I'm, I'm always somewhat sceptical about the, the, the sort of corporate um, charity day. Uh, I think it's going to be a much longer term engagement, the sort of, you know, um, helicopter in, do something and go. I think it's, there really does need to be a reassessment of perhaps a sort of longer term um, engagement. And some of the things that, uh, that Steve mentioned about this, Steve Bickle mentioned about the uh, assistance that can be given through maybe financial um, planning help or um, perhaps the bid writing, although I'm sure that most charities are more are better at bid writing than um, most businesses. Um, but that sort of thing, uh, over a longer term basis, is what I think businesses should be looking at, rather than just the, the, the one-off day. Yeah, okay. Yes, I totally agree. The number of times that we get a company ringing us up saying, oh, we've got 50 employees to do something next week. Can you get find us a charity? You know? 
Yeah, no, no, it's a tricky one. Obviously, Jen, you're dealing with this at the front line as well. Um, and, and from our perspective, uh, you've always got lots of uh, you know, ideas about in this in this area. But uh, do you think is there one particular practical thing that charities can do to attract um, a bit more sort of fundraising at this time? Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say uh, with fundraising. I, I actually think looking at it from an independent examiner or auditor or volunteer perspective, um, echoing what everybody else has said, actually sometimes having a bit of expertise, even having somebody that understands their way, you know, that can work their way around a spreadsheet for keeping records for cash flow and, and, and that sort of thing, particularly in the very small charities, um, or having somebody that has legal understanding that can read a contract if somebody is moving to a new building. Um, and I think if it, charities need to, to shout out with what they actually need. Um, I picked up something on, on a Facebook group um, probably 18 months or so ago where somebody had put a post up because they were asking for a treasurer and from the post it was very clear that a small community group didn't need what they'd posted in the advert so I sent them a message um, and we are now helping them as as part of our War Goodman corporate social responsibility just in terms of setting up a basic spreadsheet and telling them what they need to do in terms of of having directors of, of the business um, and making sure that they are then in a good position they've got a bank account set up which is in the name of the charity they've got three director trustees set up they're having meetings they're keeping accounting records and that small investment of time probably only an hour and a half makes a massive difference to how successful they're going to be moving forward now i appreciate that's something that steve p does in you know in terms of what what can does for for people that are setting up new charities but i think it's just about having an awareness that actually a lot of businesses have fantastic skills within that business that a small amount of time investment can make an enormous difference to how that charity or community group can move forward. Uh, thanks Jen. So um, I'm really grateful to, to all of you um, for coming on the panellists today um, and for all our attendees on the event today. It's been uh, amazing. We have uh, so many attendees today and I just hope you've all got something out of it. Um, well, so thanks very much, Steve Bicknell. Um, look forward to your events later on uh, in the year. Thanks ever so much to Steve Place. Um, Thank you. Great content. Thank you so much. Um, thanks very much to Grant Robson. I, I know you're a you know, really busy guy at the moment, and thanks very much. And, um, and to Jeff, and uh, thanks for sh sharing uh, the, the legal slides, not your holiday snaps. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, but, uh, and for your input today. And, of course, to our own Jen Richardson, who head, head of charities, who uh, is there to help you with anything you need, really, in the sector. Just, just get in touch. Okay. So uh, thank you all for attending. And... Next week, we're, we're looking at um, the landlord and um, tenant um, property issues. Um, we're going to go into that in a bit more detail because we've had a lot of questions about it. So hopefully you can join us next week, um, Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning. And thank you very, very much.